Thank you very much for this introduction. Actually, an expert in everything means I have no idea of anything. But uh, <laughs> let me share my, my screen here. Um, so this is uh, about Parvavali Lee closure. And uh, when I, I, I saw the title, I thought the best thing is to present a case, which basically guides you through the steps of the procedure and also highlights the problems we are encountering with this procedure. May I ask who of the faculty has experience with Parvavali closure? Abib, have you done Parvavali closure? Gus? Any yes, not by myself, not by myself. Okay, so it doesn't matter. I, I will ask you some questions in between because basically this is about general interventional cardiology. So all the, the uh, difficulties here can arise with several other procedures as well. So this is the case history. It's a 69 year old male patient. He had mitral valve uh, replacement, uh, let me move this to the side, in 2009. A parallel leak, clo uh, leak was diagnosed uh, immediately after valve replacement. So during the hospital stay of the surgery. Uh, then he's uh, suffering from increasing pulmonary hypertension and shortness of breath uh, uh, becomes uh, more severe over time. And here you can see the, uh, the leak in 3D echo. It's measured 15 by, by 10 millimeter, which is actually a pretty, pretty big hole for paravalvular leak. And the strategy uh, for mitral is my preferred strategy is to come from the femoral artery and then go to the uh, left ventricle and then try retrograde probing of the leak from the left ventricle to the left atrium and then also retrograde device implantation. And with this technique, I, I do not really need, as you understand, I do not really need transeptal punctures. You can see this is the valve, you see the left atrium, you see the wire is across uh, the leak. This was a uh, a Teromo angled wire, uh, 035, and I used a JF4 to, to cross that leak. And um, then there was problem number one. Actually, I had eight or nine problems in this case here. So this is uh, uh, problem number one. And do you see what that problem is? You see it clearly. It's ventricular tachycardia. And this was caused due to the mechanical irritation by wires and catheters, obviously. So this was problem number one, and uh, obviously this can be solved by, by changing the position of the wire, and then this problem was easy to solve. Then we had problem number two, and that was uh, friction. And that is something you uh, very often encounter when you try to close parallel leaks, not only in the mitral position, but also in the aortic position. And that was that advancement of a long sheath through the leak was impossible due to friction. That was the calcium in the uh, annulus, it's the structure of the valve. So it's a problem which occurs very often. So what do you do? When the wire is across, you cannot advance a catheter. What are the options you are thinking about? Gus, what would you do? And try wire, to, yeah. Try a different, like a guiding catheter over the wire or, or a diagnostic catheter instead of the the sheath. Yeah. yeah, good point. So I started with JR4, but but I then I can go for other catheters. And uh, uh, one catheter I like for that is the glide cath from Turumo, which is a hydrophilic surface. Right. So that's an option. A sheath, you can try different wires. So I tried all this, uh, stiffer wire, softer wire, guiding catheter, hydrophilic sheath, and, and I failed with all these techniques. Any other idea? So try a different crossing point. Uh, yeah, that's a good point. But this was this was just one big hole. So it actually there's one. It's an important point here. So sometimes you have uh, uh, sutures going across these leaks, and then you can just uh, try go to one of the other spaces there. But that's something which you cannot really see. It's uh, right. it's just you can try, right? So what I did, I was able to uh, advance. Uh, snare, that's a good option, yeah, snaring it. it. Then I would need the transeptal puncture, of course. Uh, but I wanted to avoid because of, well, it's easier to do it directly from the arterial side. So, uh, but I was able to advance a Swan-Gans catheter into the left atrium and then I inflated it there. And the Swan-Gans was in a sheath and then I could advance the sheath into the left atrium by pulling and pushing. And I will show you in a, in a, the next Great slide, idea. 
uh, sorry. Great, great idea. Yeah. So, but I, I, I can see this here, the concept. So you are across the, the uh, defect, which is, as I mentioned, a lot of friction due to the annulus and, and due to the mechanical structure of the valve. So then just advanced. So this is the problem, what happens. The hole is a big hole. It's a, a five by seven or millimeters or something like that. But what happens is that any catheter or sheath gets stuck here at one of the structures of the valve or here at the calcium. So it's not really the diameter which is diff it's the problem, but it's the friction. So then you have the swan gans on the other side, and then you pull the swan gans back into the hole, and then you can advance the sheath uh, using the balloon of the swan gans as a kind of a guide. And this technique is actually, as I mentioned earlier, it's not only for parallel closure. We use this technique also for in, in, in other situations uh, where it's sometimes helped for it. For example, when you enter a vessel and you have friction there, then you can use this technique as well. Also using other balloons, PTA balloons and so on. So then we had problem number three, and that was air embolism. And that is something which always can happen when you have a three sheath in a low pressure area like the left atrium. Uh, so you have to be aware of that, but, but you are using big sheath. This was a seven or eight French sheath. So air occurred, and you see this here on the on the T. I think it's a still frame. And uh, what happened then was uh, ST elevation and symptoms of cerebral ischemia. And this is typical for air because it goes everywhere, of course. And the question, again, this is a general problem which can occur in many other procedures like ASD or PFO closure. So what are you doing when you have that? Or if so you, you give a hundred percent oxygen through a mask. Good point. Because yeah. the bubbles are 80% nitrogen. Mm -hmm. so you give 100% oxygen, the nitrogen dissolves quickly and the bubbles disappear. Mm -hmm. Good idea. Anything else in addition to that? That's something we certainly have done, but any, anything in addition to that? I mean, there's no good, there's no good, just, uh, there's no good, good options. Yeah. Good. You give flood, flood, you just give flood to the patient, very yeah. high volume can increase blood pressure. Yeah, Absolutely. fluid is good, yeah. Mm -hmm. But I mean, the air is already in. So I mean, it's a good point to, to make sure that the patient is very hydrated before you uh, do anything in the low pressure system of the, of the circulation, but uh, the air is already in. So I think one problem when air goes to the capillaries is that then in addition to the air clots form, so I always give some, some heparin or or uh, 2B3A or something like that. So in this patient, there was spontaneous uh, uh, improvement after just waiting a couple of minutes. But if that does not happen, then I give heparin and, and 2B3A and so on. And I hope that I can prevent uh, the formation of additional clots in addition to the air, because the air by itself, this will disappear after a short time anyway. So then we, we moved on and, and used, and uh, there are different types of occluders we use for parabole closure. And one of them is the Amplatzer PDA occluder. And this is a 12 over 10 millimeter Amplatzer PDA. And you can see it here. This is the tip of the device. You can see how it is inserted there. This was a, a seven French uh, cook shuttle sheath. And you can see the uh, disc is exposed in the left atrium. Uh, it's very close to the valve, as you see, of course. You see the on TE. This, is, this helps very much to see whether we have to pull a little bit more or not. And this is our uh, opening of the proximal part, which is in the LV. And this is the advantage of the PDA occluder. It has uh, short rims, so we are not you have some risk of impinging the leaflets of the valve, but it's low because you have a small disc on both sides, actually. So is the position okay? Do you, uh, should we release it here? What do you think? I'm not sure, but it seems okay. Yeah, it seems okay. And this is problem number four, which does not really need an explanation. You see what happens? Yeah. The device embolized and is now floating around in the left atrium. So what to do now? 
go get it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You see it again? This is on, it's like a fly, right? Flying around in the left atrium. Wow. So how to get it? By surgery or what? Snare it. Snare it. Oh, the snare. Yes, we, so we did the transeptal puncture here, of course. And what is imp important when I, I have that situation, I mean, I, I don't have hundreds of cases like that, but I had a couple of cases similar to that. I use a big sheath in the vein. I used in this case an 18 French sheath and then eight French uh, transeptal sheaths inside of that 18 French sheath. And you will see later on why that, that is important. So this is the transeptal puncture. And this is now fishing, and I used a big snare. Uh, it's a German company or Sipka, but you can use any other snare. It has to be a big one because otherwise it's even more difficult to, to fish these things. Is that just one loop or is that the triple loop? This one has just one, but it's just a one loop. Here, triple. There are also snares available with multiple snares. Right. That, that would even be better, but they are smaller. So this is the disadvantage of them. Uh, so you just have to, to capture it in the right moment. And here it is. So I could not uh, sinner the capturing or the fishing, but now you see it's connected to the snare here. And uh, now I'm putting it back into the sheath. But uh, this is now problem number five. It, it was not possible to pull it back. And do you see why it was not possible? Yeah, because that 18 French sheath is canted. This is not an 18 French, it's a smaller one. It's a oh, that's the eight. Okay. Yeah, eight, yeah. It's canted, you see here on the right side, you see, I already tried it here, and then you see that the distal end of the sheath is kind of inverted. So that, that prevents me from pulling it back. So what to do now? You pull it back at the tip of the sheath and pull the whole thing back to the yeah, 18 yeah. French. Uh, quite brutal, isn't it? So I just, uh, that's what I did. I just pulled stronger so that I could pull it through the uh, septum. And then I was able to pull it down and here it comes into play why it's important to have a bigger sheath in the groin because now I can just pull it out of the sheath. Otherwise I would have to pull it through the skin and, and that's also not a, not a nice procedure. And it actually you may lose the device in this situation because the subcutaneous uh, tissue and the vessel of the vein may be stronger than the interactive septum. So I was able to pull it through the 18 French seat outside. So what now? It's a bigger device. Yeah, so I, I, I oh, yeah, bigger device, but I also thought about the different uh, axes in this case. I already have the hole in the interactive septum, so I I was able to recross that, that hole which was created by, by the prior transeptal puncture and the uh, removal of the device. And now I used an angled uh, uh, Turumo guide wire, JR4 catheter. Crossing in this area here of the mitral valve is pretty easy. It's much more difficult here on the side, but crossing from here, especially when it's such a big defect, is not difficult. And then I uh, changed from Amplitz extra stiff, which was placed into the outer just to give me a, a more solid rail. And then I introduced a, a delivery system for a BSD occluder. Uh, so I wanted to have a uh, device which has a bigger, uh, a bigger rim than the PDA. So that's why I switched to the BSD occluder. You see the distal disc of the occluders in, in the left uh, ventricle. So I pulled it back. And then I did a tuck test, what I always do. So I push and pull to make sure that it does not embolize, as happened just before. This is a 12 millimeter Amplatzer VSD occluder. And then checking the position and the valve leaflet interference. So what do you see here? Is that a lot of thrombus? No. Oh. Actually, everything is looking good. So you see the okay. liquids are, are moving. You see the correct position of the device. So that's fine. The so question is to see on Doppler if there is flow on the, on the sides of the device. See if oh, you yeah. need to put a second device yeah, before you yeah, release yeah, this. That's, that's a good idea. But, but okay. actually with, with these type of occluders, the VSD and the PDA, you always see flow through the device because they through do the device, right. The question is the sides of the yeah. device. 
Good point. So I think we did this, but I did not record this. So that was obviously okay because otherwise I would right. have to it here. But then what's very important in, in mechanical valves is to make sure that the leaflets are moving freely because you may interfere with the leaflets and right. then you have a problem. So you see, I do this under fluoro and echo as well. You can see clearly see that the leaflets are moving freely. So that's fine. But then we have problem number six. And now you can see on echo here, the leaflet is, this leaflet got stuck here. This one is moving, but now this one got stuck. Can you see that? Yeah. Yeah. So that's something you should not leave. So it was still connected, fortunately. So I just pulled it a little bit stronger into the defect and redeployed it. And this is now, again, a tuck test to conform the position of the device and stability. And then the device is released. And you see the leaflets are moving freely. So that, that looks good. Problem number seven actually came on the next day of the, on the regular ward. The patient suddenly collapsed. CPR was performed and successful. And EKG showed sinus tachycardia. And the question is, what, what happened? What is that? Any ideas? You have that information to, to make a diagnosis from the prior events. Embolized again? Uh, it could have been embolized, yeah, but I mean, what... It that should make it collapse, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, patient should not collapse, actually. Pericardial effusion. Uh, Pericardial effusion, yeah. But that would be unexpected. Uh, the the right. event, what happened here was actually not expected, but uh, kind of typical complication. We can do echocardiography, and after we can do fluoroscopy to see yeah, the yeah, yeah. and the yeah. diffusion. So what happened, it was a, 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 a pulmonary embolism, and that was, uh, here you see this on, on this end here, and this was due to the big sheath in the groin, and this is obviously something which can cause a deep vein thrombosis and then consequently pulmonary embolism. And uh, so PA pressure was 60 over 30, uh, and uh, lysis, lysis was contraindicated due to the recent arterial puncture. Patient was stable after the initial collapse, so we gave him heparin only, and, and pressure was doing fine. But then we had problem number eight, and that was uh, some neurological dysfunction, which was persisting at day two. CT showed no ischemic infarction. Yeah. Symptoms improved over the next few days, and fortunately had full recovery before, before discharge. So the outcome, I'm running out of time here. So the outcome, marked clinical improvement, no permanent neurological dysfunction, no other complications. And also we did not have any problems in the next eight patients, just to ensure you that it's not always like dangerous like this one here. Thank you very much for your attention. Very nice case. Thank you. Yeah, thank very you very much. I'm glad thank the patient was much. in your hands. Yeah. <laughs> I'm not sure because I caused yes. complications. You have the expertise to come out of all nine complications. Any questions or comments? Horst, Horst yeah. what was the length of that procedure? I, I don't recall, but uh, maybe 20 minutes, something like that. The whole procedure? <laughs> I, I don't remember. I don't know. I don't know. Just, just okay. Yeah.